Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Today on Insight, we will be talking about our best to unlock the potential value chains in the Nigerian agricultural sector as an imperative for achieving sustainable and inclusive agricultural growth in Nigeria. My guest is joining us via Zoom from Bauchi, and I'm quite excited about that conversation. Down the line, Elizabeth will be joining us with another conversation on advancing human capital for national economic prosperity. An assistant professor at the Florida State University will be part of that conversation. My name is Namdi Odipo. Welcome to the program. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language issue. Thing. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. It's not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate, deliberate tactic. You know, many of these people come into the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions that... Of course, mean, um, it is the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. And now we begin. Let's talk about the value chain process. The value chain for an agricultural produce contains every person involved from the cultivation of that crop, uh, right from where now the seeds were acquired, to the consumer that will be eating them. Each individual's action in, in a value chain is very important, as all of the players in the value chain are interconnected. Where one link in the value chain is negatively impacted, it is likely, more likely, to affect everyone else in the value chain. At this time, when Nigeria contends with issues of food insecurity, it becomes germane to review why farmers are still experiencing wastages arising from varying factors, and why farmers are unable to add value to produce, you know, to enhance uh, the, the value or the marketability of their produce. Uh, let's talk some more on this issue with my guest, Grace uh, Forsen, development professional, an agriculture economist and expert in agri extension, extension services, I should say. She's also currently the country projects manager for MEDA Nigeria Way Project, a leading agricultural market systems project operations. Welcome to Inside Grace. Good to have you join us all the way from the city of Bauchi. Uh, good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Great. So let's begin with um, perhaps something of a foundation to base our entire discourse on this issue. Uh, what is the market research saying uh, in terms of promising agricultural investment or agricultural investment for various ag agricultural value chain? We, of course, know there are massive opportunities, but, uh, but are, are the investments, are they investment friendly so that people do not just um, throw in their time, th throw in their energy and resources for ventures with bottlenecks all the way and possibly very little gains to show for it at the end of the day. Uh, I'd like for you to convince the doubting Thomases, uh, Thomases, I beg your pardon, of, of the inherent and Im massive opportunities that, that lie in the value chain in Nigeria, mm -hmm. inherent in agricultural value chain in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I um, appreciate this time. We definitely have enormous opportunities in Nigeria. It is, there's no gain saying that Nigeria is uh, endured with a lot of opportunities. We have over 80 million hectares of land, vast productive agricultural land in Nigeria. But as we speak, only 33%, only 33 million, sorry, I beg your pardon, is utilized, amounting to about 39%. So you see that more than half of the vast, fertile, productive land in Nigeria is on top, unutilized, and yet there is hunger. And so what does that tell you? It tells you that there's a lot to be done. There are lots of efforts that we need to bring to play. Um, over 70% of the active you know, population, the youth, could be engaged in agriculture, but uh, you, you still find that while I know because of 
where I sit and the work we do, that they are willing, they are willing to use, you know, willing to engage actively in agriculture. These are all opportunities and potential that we have. We um, have a lot of human resources, and 80% of the people that are in uh, active, you know, agriculture are at the bottom of the pyramid. They are at the bottom of the pyramid willing to engage, mm. actively um, looking for opportunities to engage. So Nigerian youth, Nigerian women that I work with, they are there at the bottom of the pyramid, waiting to engage, we are looking for platforms. So as we continue the discussion, I'm sure we're yes. going to touch on the platforms and of other areas, but to say potential, I think yes. potential Yes, based on your experience or your experiences and based on, of course, some of the researches you would have done as well on market opportunities and all of that, would you just relate that to the opportunities, inherent opportunities, especially in value chain, and then um, tell us why these, why these on top um, massive um, human resource base that you've referenced, the young youth, young persons, are not taking advantage of these opportunities as, as, as they are, as they were? Yeah, I, I would say first the enabling environment. The enabling environment isn't as friendly as we would imagine it to be for them to try, to even engage. You see, um, when we started our work, where we, we work, we see a lot of them wanting to engage. They are not owners of farmlands. They have to go and hire. Okay. And then hiring is based most of the time on perhaps who you know, not who has the capacity, not who has um, the ability to, to make things happen, but who knows somebody. And so this is a limiting factor for most of the youth that we want to engage. We find that though the population is there, the human resources is there, they are really youth, their enabling environment is a huge, huge challenge for them to you engage actively. You talk about this enabling environment. You've highlighted some of the issues uh, that you think um, present as inhibitions to while, I mean, youths, like you've said, are not taking full, you know, full advantage of these opportunities that are, that are there. But, you know, are these opportunities even there? And I need you to speak to me based on experience. And I'll tell you a bit of my own experience as well. In the course of my job, I've had the opportunity to look at some of government's interventions, especially in the area of agriculture, especially uh, with regard to um, value addition. I'll tell you something. I was somewhere uh, sometime last year in Kaduna uh, where they had this massive ginger farm. And um, mm -hmm. I had visited the place a couple of years ago and noticed uh, that um, what they did basically was to plant, you know, cultivate, harvest as raw material and then push on to off takers and to the market but surprisingly like i said i went there last year and i noticed some form of value addition and i thought okay ah uh, this because of the business i had visited some time ago like i said and i i asked i ventured for that and asked the gentleman the farmer why he's chosen to go a bit further to add value to what he ordinarily used to sell uh, back in the day. And he said, look, it makes more money that way. And that's exactly how I want us to start off our conversation, talking about these opportunities. Are there opportunities, whether it's for the ginger, whether it's for ginger, whether it's for cashew, whether, you know, uh, down the line, in, in terms of agriculture, if we were to unlock the potential of value chain, you know, in Nigeria, how much so can it lead us to, you know, that promised economic prosperity that we all envisage that we all talk about yeah thank you very much um what we do is to support our clients to add value to agricultural products and um seven years when we started this ago when we started we realized that the moment they get it out from farm from the farm it's to the market street and um we had time to engage this uh, uh producers uh, as to why they don't think about adding value. The cost of it, the equipment that is required, you know, all of that is a challenge. And um, we, once we supported some of them, 
with what it takes, bringing the standard organizations, NAFTA, it was providing, and that's why I mentioned a leveling environment, because we stepped in to make these um, platforms available, available for them. And you would be surprised that from the city of Vauchi, you still have some of our products, some of the clients' products and the producers' products in Abuja, in Potakot, in Lagos. Why? Because they've been able to uh, tap into the platforms, the environment that we made you know, available for them to engage and to have this product package, meeting standards organizations of Nigeria and the NAPDA, and to have them on the uh, put uh, on the shelves in the super stores. So you see that enabling environment is very critical. Um, yes, so when, when you, and you, I mean, you've talked about this enabling environment severally now, and you know, it registers with me. Well, what then would you, and this is talking in terms of, I mean, you've raised the issue of land, you've raised the issue of impute, you raised the issue of fertilizer. So these are issues that you've raised. I reckon, I, I reckon when you, when you infer that um, optimization of the, you know, of the agricultural value chain uh, can mm -hmm. expand, you know, agriculture and make, perhaps make it one of the major drivers of Nigerians' um, economic prosperity or resurgence, you mean that in a sense where agriculture isn't just treated as a development program, but as a mm -hmm. massive business ecosystem. So I would like for you, um, I haven't laid out these challenges that you've talked about. I'd like for you to lay out for me now what you think constitutes the most basic structure, you know, or foundation for the, uh, the kind of progress you want to see happen within this landscape that you're talking about, whether it's in terms of um, policy, whether it's in terms of governance, or the kind of participation you want to see, you know, that is required to get us to the, that level that you think we should be in terms of value addition or processing? Thank you very much. So I would say that um, whether it be policy structures, we have to be intentional. Our government okay. have to be intentional. I know there are policies, there are uh, structures that have been put in place. I remember the Anchor Borrower Program, the warehousing receipts, and all of those things that have happened with good intentions. Good intentions. But until we are able to get the right personnel in the right places, I tell you, it's 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 a dream that is really really far to to realize, because we can't take um, a square peg and put them in round holes and expect them to perform. That is not going to happen. And so once we have policies as perfect and as good as they can be, we need to understand that implementers of those policies would have to be people that are wired to make those things happen. Okay, so this is basically policy meeting expertise, like you've said, and I buy into that absolutely. And uh, of course, you, you've introduced the human element to our discourse, and um, that also does make a whole lot of sense. You're a practitioner. You're you're, you're a field person. I'd like for us to break down our conversation and perhaps take it now to the field. In uh, looking at some of what you've said or all of what you've said, uh, let's take it from the, from the grounds up now and begin from the very start of the process with the farmer, that level, that stage of cultivation. Um, what do you think should be added to, in, in terms of, I mean, considering all that you've said now, policy meeting, expertise, and all of that. I mean, and knowing, remembering that our conversation is on value chain, so the role of the farmer is key. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's key to this whole discourse because um, a value chain, of course, is considered as one of the key elements of the food system, and that process begins with the farmer. So I'd like, I'd like to reference the small older farmer who constitutes the bulk of farming or farmers in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken. And if at that level, at the very beginning, the small older farmer uh, contends maybe with the issue of finance to perhaps invest in basic inputs, like you talked about it, something like seeds, you know, you talked mm -hmm. about fertilizer. You know, uh, if he doesn't even, he's having challenges with such thing, I don't know how he, how he, he could, that small other farmer could contend with something like small-scale irrigation needed to even raise 
productivity and perhaps generate sustainable income. You know, if we do not get it right, you, and if we do not get it right at that level, it constitutes a, a clog in the wheel of progress right from the very start. So I want your expertise, I want your input, I, I want your take on what you think should be done at that basic level. You, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, the farmer's action or inaction determines the quality and, you know, and quantity of yields. How critical is it that cultivation, that that cultivation stage, you know, is gotten right so that, you know, whatever happens beyond that link, you know, is also, is also, is also right. So what, how mm -hmm. can we get it right at that, at that start point? Yeah, thank you very much for this very, very critical and important question. So I would like to say correct targeting. Most of the time, when initiatives come to play, they already have a list of farmers, political farmers, if I would say, that are not the real farmers that are on doing their, farm, their business, not the real producers. So there are initiatives with a whole lot of lists of, I quote, political, I'll call them political farmers who are not the farmers at the grassroots level. And then whatever incentives or whatever um, government is trying to bring to play, they go into the hands of all of these political farmers. And what do you get? Of course, when it is not the real thing, it cannot be the real thing. So it can't give you the kind of results we're looking for. So correct targeting in the first place is very, very critical to getting the kind of results we want to see. So meet a farmer who has been in that farming business. He knows his onions. He's been doing that. And then you bring an initiative. You have those real, genuine farmers on the ground, and you incentivize them. You build their capacity with new, improved agronomic practices. They know that, oh, for this particular uh, half hectare of land, I could cultivate it in this manner and have this quantity of yield of course they will give in everything it takes to work with what they're learning i have seen it in the work we have done when there's correct targeting you will definitely get the results you want but when we do a wrong targeting we get other people who are not the real thing of course you are bound to fail at the start you, at, at the very beginning it's failure before it even gets anywhere so correct targeting is very critical to get the real farmers and to give them the technical assistance the capacity building whatever they need to enhance their capacity their skill um we would be able to get the results we want and for what something we did is to um if you ask me what are fabricators of technology because we, we we have to move from imports to using what we have and to build on what we have to give us what we want and so we brought the producers to, to with the local fabricators of technology see how you can engage what do you need of course you know you can't go by the you can't buy those foreign machines foreign equipment and they they sat there we provided that platform they discussed and the fabricators, for the first time, they knew, oh, we could engage actively with these uh, end users, what we manufacture, and they could in tell us what they want. So this so is just an example of what your group, your agency has done with uh, farmers at the rural area. Is that, is that right? And it was really, really very um, productive, very successful, because it has enhanced their productivity, because they are able to acquire even though we did uh, a discount for them, so they're able to acquire those machineries and it enhanced. Because majority of our farmers are still doing the uh, traditional uh, mechanization with uh, holes, with all of those uh, equipment, and there's much they can do with that, even if they have to their disposal a whole hectare of land. Of course, they can't use uh, hole and uh, all of those tools to uh so me mechanization to becomes important at this point you know and deployment of technology and machinery right. for 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 agriculture but I, i'd like to take you up on an issue i i don't know if something you also have um, experience with based on some of your field work you know in several rural parts of nigeria families and communities continue to contend with um, issues of diet and nutritional challenges but 
we do there are findings which show that um, certain crops and i'll take cowpea for instance or maybe i should talk about soya beans of course there's also millet and so on these grains are certified as highly nutritional and they are capable of in, in improving nutrition and growth not just for children mm -hmm. but for adults as well but yet we still have this 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 problem this uh, nutritional problems like i've talked about can you perhaps speak a bit you know or specifically to how intentional you used that word earlier and you know and when you talked about targeting you know targeting the mm -hmm. farmers that is deliberate that is also intentional can we also be intentional in utilizing you know value chain towards improving nutritional outcomes um this is not a government problem i i know i mean not just a government problem i know you know that are there reasons perhaps why again the private sector investors are not deliberately uh, you know identifying and um, intentional about their, their interventions for for value chain development that to address issues of um, diet based nutrition problems you know in nigeria uh, do you have experience with that in your field of work yeah i would like to say that i wouldn't say private sector are not doing it but perhaps it's not as um as massive as it, is, as it should be to bring about that uh uh difference or the the, the the um the change that we would want to see i know even in the space that we work, I know a few of our, uh, our partners that have been using the RUTM, that is the for nutrition for children, for malnourished children. So okay. before now, I know UPID are the ones you know, bringing in all of these uh, uh, food uh, supplements for malnourished children. But when it became necessary that there were gaps it wasn't coming forward as they would want to have it we discussed with some of our private you know partners to see what can we do and we have uh someone who took it up as a challenge right now they have that they are producing it and they are uh, distributing it across the northeast i know and i know further than that others are doing it but we need there is no meaningful development that could go across the country that would not have government, you know, supporting or having government to contribute to that because of the, when you talk about power, when you talk about all the infrastructure that they need to make production happen, you know, um, value addition needs power. It needs power. It needs equipment. So yes. some of these... Uh, uh, companies are having it difficult because they lack this basic basic uh, uh, infrastructure in place to ensure that production is continuous and production is uh, able to meet the demands. And then we, the place of awareness. So our national orientation agency, if you talk about it, has to there has to be awareness that is being created. People need to be aware that yes, this is possible. These food products are highly nutritious. We can't do it. So we can't sit in silos and expect the entire um, uh, country should know about what's happening. How do we ensure that collectively as a nation, we sell all of these things out there? Social media, they're working. Private sector companies can do it. But as a, as a country, we need to be, I use the word again, intentional, to ensure that we sell it out there. We make it, um, we create that awareness and uh, support uh, this, our companies to have this um, enabling environment. A lot of them are crying for power. They can't afford diesel. Production has, if I say tripled, is an understatement. So the cost of production has gone you know, haywire. So how do they meet up with all of that if they want to venture into new products to meet mm. the diet need of you know the growing population grace i'd like to redirect our conversation and take you to an area i mean that you raised quite earlier just you know just when we started our conversation you know mm -hmm. and um, it's it's this whole it revolves around this whole subject matter of being intentional again can we you know, be deliberate and intentional, especially when it comes to crop production in Nigeria. I, I know 
as a country, we still dominate the world's um, yam production. I'm not sure whether it still stands at 70% or more, but I'm wondering what you think ab about giving targets and timelines to agricultural boards and maybe even states in Nigeria, states in Nigeria, for, for the production of, of um, certain targeted crops and for even cash revenue accruing from uh, these um, food crops, like palm oil, like, like cocoa, like rubber, uh, uh, from a dough, like cashew, perhaps from the southeast, like um, ginger from the north, and a whole bunch of other crops where Nigeria should otherwise have a um, comparative advantage. Do you think, I mean, what do you think of that idea? Saying, for instance, Delta, give me 10,000 metric tons of this crop within this timeline, um, Edo, give me this. Kano, give me this. Kaduna, give me this. Do you think that's the way to go at this point? I have had this in my mind for quite some time to say if we have a Ministry of Agriculture, we should be able to say the Ministry of Agriculture in this particular location, this is where you have comparative advantage in terms of whether it is cassava, if it's palm oil, or whatever. You have the comparative advantage. Now make it happen for us. But what if they don't? What happens? Are they going to be um, sanctioned for not meeting up there? Do they have whatever it takes to make that production happen? So yes, I agree with you 100% that for me, I feel it's a way to go. To task the government, because they are the custodians of the, the, the professors, the research institutes, whatever, the seed, the seed uh, institutes, everything they do so they are there they could make that happen but if they don't what happens like you go to uh, uh, locations where people should be at work they are not there and nothing is happening so what happens so it's, it's as much as we say okay this thing should happen we want you to bring sociometric tons of these products because you have the comparative advantage you can do it of course we know that it can be it can be done it can be done, there's no doubt about it. But if it doesn't happen, who is responsible for making sure it happens? And who monitors to ensure that this, as we say it, it has to be done? See, we do things and get away with it because we know that we can't get away with it. If we know we cannot get away with things, we will be committed to making sure it happens. So you find Nigerians, Nigerians all across the globe doing great things, doing excellent things, exploit, innovation, creativity. Why are we not doing it here? Mm. It's because of responsibility. Well, if that's... We will be yes, please, please, let me let you land on your talk. Or in actions, and I believe it is possible. So please go ahead. Uh, great. You know, in rounding off our conversation, uh, I'd like to um, ask you a question, uh, and I suspect this might be very close to your to your heart, and it's on women farmers <laughs> and their contribution to Nigeria's national food security objectives. Uh, you know, and I know it's possible. Uh, well, not I know you know that, <laughs> and this is quite ironical, I should say, that even though women. Well, I do not have the data here, but it's, and I'm not saying I proved it, but in most parts of Africa, women constitute, if not the greater, maybe a significant percentage of farmers, you know, in yeah. that country, even here in Nigeria. I think I suspect that's also the case. But what I hear is that they still produce, and that, that is in terms of Nigeria now, uh, women, in spite of this massive population, still produce 20 to 30 percent less than men or male farmers in Nigeria. I mean, and it makes me wonder what groups like your group are doing to, you know, close that gap and perhaps create linkages for these rural women farmers towards, you know, closing that gap of gender inequality in, in, in an effort to boost agricultural uh, produce from women farmers in Nigeria. I'm sure you're aware of what the First Lady is doing at the moment right now with our Renewed Hope um, agricultural, Women Agricultural Support Initiative. I mean, this is also in line with that objective. And all of these align with the President's um, objective and national food um, uh, objective on national food security for Nigeria. How do you think 
you know, having so much uh, population as farmers and yet under underperforming, as the, as it will seem. I mean, forgive me for saying that, but underperforming, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, not like the Nigerian Falcons at perform at performs the Super Eagles. In this case, it's mm -hmm. it's the reverse that is the case. How do we then close that gap, that that gap of gender inequality in terms of uh, production uh, between the male and uh, female farmers in Nigeria? So male hijack, I would say male hijack in most of the efforts you know to make happen. I told you about how we we are ninety percent of the over nineteen thousand people we've engaged are women, you know, and we were very intentional to ensure that we give women the um, opportunity, the platform to thrive and to succeed. So if you come here, the women are saying we want to take the flag of this project up because it had really turned our lives around. So it's possible. That intentionality is very critical. And um, women are not the first sometimes to get information. So ah, information, flow, information. 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 Access to information. Yes. So information, they, they, that's where you see when they are not aware, they have the male hijack, even before they know anything is happening, already the, 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 female, the male counterparts have already gone ahead. And when they come to get access, the male are considered more, the male gender is are considered more, you know, they give more priority, you know, than the women. Okay, so how do we now close that gap so that women can be at par? Women farmers can now be at par. How do we close? What do you think should be done? We should be intentional to see pro to see initiatives that are all women, hundred percent women. You oh, know, okay. for women, and, and I tell you that in Bauchi, where we work, because access to finance. I'm just giving this a case in point. Access to finance was a very very difficult um, uh, uh, thing to deal with. So the women said we're going to challenge this uh, uh, issue. They set up. Uh, female-owned, female-led, female-managed microfinance institution because they are tired of having to compete with the male counterparts and they see they are not making any progress. So let's set up our own. Let's be intentional about it. So from the gates up to the MD, it's all women. The monies they mobilize all from women. All the things they are doing are led by women and for women. So once they have um, other uh, aggregators of farm products, so they engage aggregators directly, so they okay. have uh, uh, products that they cultivate and they aggregate it themselves and they go to the market. So they do that market linkages, partnerships, they get partnerships themselves, they do all of those things for themselves. They are intentional to want to challenge that norm. They want to break the barriers that have been limiting them. Breaking. So I see if we're, we're now, we would be able to make it happen. Women are capable, they have the strength, they have what it takes. We only need that opportunity. We only need that the system is, is more friendly, you know, to women and give them the their dues. You see, I, I, I suspected and I was right. I knew you were going to be, I mean, I, I knew this would be close to your heart. I knew you would be passionate about this issue. And it does, it does seem like a very good place to end our conversation on, I mean, this current conversation, you know, our interaction that we've had so far. Uh, I would like to thank you so much, Grace Folsin, development professional, a Greek economist, an expert in agricultural extension services. Um, thank you so much indeed for coming on Insights. By the way, Grace is the country projects manager for MEDA Nigeria Way Project, a civil society funded agricultural market systems and project operations. I would, um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts on this issue. Even though towards the end there, you, you came off a bit as, as a chauvinist, uh, but uh, we can understand that and we can understand why. So we'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the so, program. And I do not mean that in a bad way. I mean, you, you came off as an advocate, which is, which is well and good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Up next is Elizabeth Omori, 
uh, she intends to appraise how Nigeria can and as its massive human capital base for economic prosperity. I think she will be touching a lot on women again and how women can use you know, their, their comparative advantage in terms of population, in terms of um, you know, um, human expertise to, to, to contribute to, to Nigeria's economic prosperity. I guess, of course, teaches at the Florida State University and she is grounded on the economic intricacies of the issue. Elizabeth Omori is up next. Human capital development enhances and improves the skills and potential of individuals. It recognizes that individuals are valuable assets and economists say governments must prioritize investing in human capital development, especially women, to maximize their contributions and productivity. This involves investing in education, training and career development initiatives to equip citizens with the competences to succeed in critical sectors. Now, the question is, how responsive are governments, organizations, and individuals to developing this process? My guest, Professor Ene Ikpebe, an assistant professor at Florida State University, USA, who joins us via Zoom, will speak to us. Professor Ene, thank you so much for joining us on Insights. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Thank you so much. Well, at this point, I must say that uh, Professor Ene is very much interested in questions uh, concerning women's human capital development as advanced by education or ended by familiar challenges uh, such as early marriage and poverty hampering the development of women. So, Professor Ene, tell us, what is the drive? Yes, um, I'm interested because I see the connection between human capital um, development and national development. Um, I can see that if you want to grow an economy, if you want to advance a country's um, stance on the world stage, um, a sure way to do it, um, or at least a way that has a lot of research evidence behind it, is to invest in human capital, which, as you um, just defined, is the stock of knowledge and skills and competencies that um, is in individuals that helps them promote their own personal, economic, or social well-being. That's a definition from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. That's my draft. All right, I would really need you to break this down for us. So why is this process so important to all around development? Well, it's important because um, human beings have a lot of, um, you know, indwelling skills and knowledge, but it, it stays at the same level unless there's investment, um, whether that's through schooling or through other kinds of skills acquisitions types of programs. Um, so yes, if we want to have them be productive members of society, if we want to um, curb crime, if we want to improve healthcare outcomes, if we want to improve just outcomes in general for human beings, um, then yes, it's important for us to, to invest in human capital. I'm well aware that human capital development has to do with way more than um, just um, education and or just um, avoiding issues like early marriage. I'm also well aware that human capital development is pertinent to both genders. We don't um, think that um, women are the only ones who deserve um, investment in their human capital. However, because of the um, evident gap in investments uh, between men and women and the evident gap in the outcomes that we've been able to measure just as researchers, it makes um, it makes it an important and just an emergent issue to focus on now. We've actually mentioned poverty, early marriage, um, discrimination and other factors. Now let's bring it down, break it down, bring it down to Africa. What are the challenges mm -hmm. of human capital development within the African region? Aside from um, what we have mentioned. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so typically, when we say human capital, we, we immediately take our minds to education um, and investment in skills acquisition um, programs. And that's, that's all well and good. But I think when you think about the gap in uh, resource availability, that tends to be one of the most important things. So for the African um, continent, a lot of countries on, on our continent have um, difficulty allocating um, 
enough of their budget to investment in human capital. So, so for me, in essence, I take it a step back. So before we talk about how well the programs are designed, how um, beautifully the policies are, are, are created and, and implemented, do we even have the resources, whether personnel or non-personnel, to devote to these issues? Okay, you, you mentioned something now, you said um, bridging the ca gap in resource allocation. How do we bridge this gap? Yes. Well, a really broad question, and that is what government exists to do. So to figure out ways to allocate scarce resources in a way that um, best um, secures efficiency, uh, uh, secures effectiveness. And so I, I will not... Um, um, I would not say that there is one way to go about it, but it really should be done with um, just awareness of the times, what matters most at the time. So for instance, we can think back to a time in our own country, in Nigeria, where it made sense to um, allocate a lot of um, resources into educating large portions of the population in STEM education. So science, technology, um, um, engineering, and math. It made a lot of sense to do that because of the ways that we wanted our, our economy to grow. So that's just an example of what I mean by having government decisions being um, be made in a way that takes into account the times and what um, the goals are. So it's a broad answer, I know, but that's really the best that we can do in a short time. I think we just need to, to make, um, we need to do policy making in a way that is aware of what, what's going on and factors in all the, the important um, points, yes. Okay. You know, when we talk about human capital development, it's actually a very important process in life. Whose responsibility? It's, it's all of our responsibility. Um, the individual has to have the um, intrinsic drive to invest in themselves. So whether that's through enrolling in school um, or into actually going through the, um, the learning process that teachers um, avail to them, um, families are also responsible because they make the decision of you know, schools, whether, whether or not to enroll children in school, whether um, they will um, go for six years or nine years or 12 years or go through a master's or a PhD program, um, governments have the responsibility too because they have um, the ability to either make school um, free or paid and then to create an enabling, enabling environment for the private sector to also um, tap into education. And then firms as well can create environments that encourage employees to go after continue, continuing professional development. So take up opportunities to um, get another degree or to get this certificate or that certificate. And so I can go on and on. Essentially, it's a, it's a universal responsibility and everybody needs to be aware of the ways in which their decisions either advances or hinders their own human capital development. Most people are not interested in investing in themselves to make an impact. Why is this so? And what can be done to encourage people to see reasons why they should develop themselves to fit into any critical sector made available to them? Um, so I, I'll, I'll answer this question by, by talking about risks and rewards. I think that individuals will invest in um, going through processes that they have seen to, to have rewards for them. And so whether that's an internal reward of you know, feeling a sense of fulfillment or an external reward like higher remuneration or, um, or having a job in the first place or being able to you know, actually make decisions and see them be implemented, all of this um, plays into an individual's uh, motivation. And so I think a lot of the time what we see happening is that individuals don't see these rewards. They, they see that people who have um, certain positions in society or in government or in private sector firms don't necessarily have um, a history of, of investment in their professional um, portfolio, in their human capital. And so they shy away from putting in the same work because they don't see that it will yield um, the desired results. And so I, I think that um, it, it really comes down to being convinced that the risk of putting in time, because we're talking about using time um, that is scarce, that we can only put towards a, a few th things at a time. Um, 
and taking that time and putting it into investing in oneself. And so human beings have to be able to weigh these things out, risk versus reward, and actually be convinced in themselves that there is a reward to, to investing in human capital, yes. Okay, so how do we advance this process? Our societies are still being confronted with several social and economic issues. I think I would like you to peg around gender inequality. This is still okay. a challenge. Um, Yes, um, I think there are a lot of already well-designed programs and policies that we see being implemented um, either at the, so at the federal level that have not been adopted at the state or the local level. Also, in some cases, there are programs or um, ideas, agreements that have been signed on to at the international level that haven't been um, brought down into the federal, state, and local, local level. And so I think these are some avenues through which we can advance um, gender equity and um, deal with these gaps that we see in outcomes. For instance, something that I'm very passionate about is the um, minimum marriageable age policy in our country, Nigeria, where you have at the federal level um, a stipulated age above or below which girls are not al allowed to, to be married, not because there's any type of um, um, switch that happens when they turn 18. However, legally, there are many things that are av available to them at the age of um, 18 that are not available to them beforehand. And so being um, very aggressive about taking such decisions um, will help bridge this gap between um, um, outcomes for, for boys and outcomes for girls. Um, so, And then the same thing goes for any other type of, of, of policy and program. We are hardly inventing things that have not ever been thought about. There, there's probably a country or um, a region or somewhere else on, on the continent that has done a lot of the things that we want to do. And then even within our country, if we're, we're making decisions at the local level, there are probably other local governments that have gone through the same process. So I think um, what we call policy learning is something that we need to um, increase our culture in. So just being willing to look around and um, see who is doing it right and you know taking steps to, to, to follow after them. You're showing them that there is something to be gained from becoming a better person, from increasing their personal well-being, that it doesn't only benefit them, it benefits their family, Families, it benefits their organization if they, this is in the context of, of a work environment or it benefits their, their government or the, the nation. So um, yes, I think uh, we, we need to see the link as opposed to the, the divide between the two. We're investing in human capital development precisely because we want to increase empowerment. Okay, for every woman out there who is striving, doing so much to advance in this area, would you like to give tips on how to improve on this so that he, she can make her life more meaningful and contribute yes. positively to society and her immediate family. Absolutely. Um, so there are many things that I could say, but I think one thing that we um, need to never forget is that education really does um, avail your, it avails you of a lot of options that you might not have otherwise. And so taking every opportunity, um, as long as it makes sense, obviously, in your context, to, in, 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 to be educated. So whether that is um, primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, and then to be um, very devoted to actually learning the material. Because I, I've, I, I've mentioned briefly that there is a difference between um, being enrolled in uh, a learning institute and actually absorbing the material that's presented to you. And so I think um, women can empower themselves more, can um, develop their human capital if they really commit to learning what is presented and um, just having that drive to achieve all that they want to achieve and, and using education as a means to do that. I'm a testament um, to, to, to that process and what it yields. And so my encouragement is for as many as are um, interested to also do the same thing. But there's a huge gap between how much per capita is invested in education. And so we still have um, people not be able to take advantage of universal basic education um, um, policy and all the programs that have been birthed from that. So those are some of the, the differences that I see. However, interestingly, on the side of obstacles to human capital development, there are some similarities. So there is a problem of early marriage um, here, even though it's 
much lower in the amount number number of people that are exposed to that. There is the problem of early marriage here, um, in, similar to how you have in Nigeria. So I, I, I bring that up to help us see that really even countries that we might see as being um, farther along, along um, on the process to um, of, of development have areas that they can still be improved. And I think that's important for countries behind, so to speak, to remember. All right, Professor N. Ikpebe, Assistant Professor at the Florida State University, USA. We want to thank you so much for joining us on Insight this week. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. In rounding off this episode, I'd like to do a recap of some of what's been said earlier today by our guest. Honestly, there are immense potential for Nigeria's agriculture or economic prosperity, I beg your pardon, whether drawing from its massive natural resources or its vast human capital. What remains is to open up the space for Nigerians to explore and exploit the numerous opportunities which abound. Take agriculture, for instance, and we talked about that earlier. Timely, targeted, perception interventions in agriculture promises a truckload of gains for everyone involved in the value chain, starting with the farmer, the off-taker who sells the produce to the processor, who then commissions the packaging company and then the distributors. Even for the retail store business owner, who then sells to the consumer. Ultimately, it benefits us all as a nation, and it is critical that we take those important steps that are needed to get us to where we want to be. Mind you, this is even more important as we hope to create jobs, increase our national revenue, and continue the march towards meeting our national food security objectives. And that, my friend, is the recap. Whatever the issues are, the National Assembly is constitutionally empowered to scrutinize however complex or intricate we have involved all the, uh, the the academia the members of the academia we have involved the academies be it government policies or in fact any issue of public concern our job is to help you gain clarity and make sense of it all this is not really healthy for our democracy there's a lot of um aggrievance in terms of who has been in power longest and who becomes the governor of the it's also in the quality of food being consumed. After all, perception is insight. And gaining.